Our guest for today's episode is Amy Elizabeth Fox. Amy Elizabeth Fox is a senior leadership strategist with experience consulting to senior leadership on issues related to human capital, organizational health, and leadership development. She is the Chief Executive Officer of Mobius Executive Leadership, a premier leadership development firm with offices in Boston and Switzerland. Over the past decade and a half, she has spoken at numerous national industry gatherings and led workshops for corporate executives across the country. Amy is also a psychotherapist and an executive coach. We hope you enjoy this conversation. Welcome to The Point of Relation. My name is Thomas Tübel and you're listening to my podcast and I'm very delighted to be sitting here with my very good friend, Amy Fox. So welcome, Amy. Thank you so much, Thomas. It's wonderful to be here. I mean, we did so many things already together and we are collaborating and working together for many years and I'm happy to have you on my podcast and that we can speak a little bit about uh, and I think we're going to have a series of uh, of podcast uh, interviews here. Maybe you can share a little bit what, what's what's the leading edge of your work now because usually where we are most excited about what we do that's where our fire is that's where arrows lies and uh, maybe we start there and then we see um, how that connects to everything you did so far. Yeah, wonderful. Well, I'm looking forward to this and all the forthcoming conversations as well. Uh, you know, maybe it's worth acknowledging, Thomas, that the leading edge or frontier of Mobius's work since you and I met each other about 10 years ago has really been trying to integrate the profound wisdom you're bringing about trauma and the importance of trauma healing into the way leadership development work is conducted in various organizations, both in the private and in the public sector. And I think um, it's really still a, a bit cutting edge for people in the world of organizational development, coaching, and facilitation to understand the enormity of the influence that traumatic symptoms have on the way organizations um, ha- uh, operate and the way their cultures are formed, and to understand that you can't really intervene at the level of culture change without coming in as a restorative or healing agent, um, because all of the interventions you might make at the level of the symptoms of the behaviors we see, the dysfunctions we see, the derailers we see in team dynamics and organizational dynamics and innovation um, cannot be addressed at the surface. Um, And, you know, the extraordinary teaching that you've been doing with Mobius practitioners and um, the collaborations we've had with you, I think, have really guided us to look much more deeply, to have a much more sensitized ability to diagnose what's driving those symptoms and to address them at their root. Um, and I think for many companies, when they start that kind of really a profound healing journey, they start to see a kind of sea change in the way leaders are operating and interacting with each other that enables and unlocks a whole other level of vitality, of openness, of authenticity, of vulnerability, you know, some of the cultural texture that we now know from a lot of research is critical uh, when people are trying to deal with a very fast-changing, volatile environment. Um, Another way to say that is more and more leaders are having to deal with unpredictability and uncertainty, and there's a kind of inner stability or inner equanimity that needs to be cultivated in order to meet that kind of new frontier. Yeah, that's amazing. And I mean, I just recently had a conversation with our mutual friend, Bob Anderson, and uh, Bob told me that they actually um, kind of evaluated 3 million, uh, the circle evaluations that they do, the leadership circle evaluations. And and the number one factor that all the people that were high on the innovative side of leadership uh, said that relationality is the top the top quality you have to have as a leader. And I thought, wow, that's that's so profound. And I think what what you did, I think the the excellence of your work in organizations is that you actually manage to bring very deep transformational work into so many different organizations. And maybe you can tell us a bit because often there is like a shy away or like we we don't want to fully engage with deep transformation in organizations, but your work shows that actually deep transformation is possible, is possible in, in large scale organizations and, um, and has a powerful impact. So maybe you can share a little bit from your experience, like what you have seen and what's what's the change that is happening in organization given the work that you're, that Mobius and you're doing. 
Yeah, I, I'd love to talk about that. Let me first uh, make a momentary bow to our colleague, Bob Anderson, who's been a real pioneer in helping organizations and leaders to understand how their reactive patterns and habits have deeper roots and to look in a meaningful way, very much consistent with what you and I are talking about. Um, I think there, that it's right what you're saying. There's a lot of fear inside organizations to ask leaders to look um, meaningfully at their life experiences and early childhood narratives in particular, that seems like a kind of delicate personal domain that should be cordoned off. But I believe, and I think you believe, that that privatization of one's interiority is part of the pathology of trauma, which suggests we're supposed to somehow have the resilience or inner strength um, to move past early hurts by ourselves. Um, and it's just utterly counterintuitive because as you teach, relation is the repair. Um, so if we don't create micro contexts in which leaders can look deeply and ask the questions of their lives and support one another to do that, um, we're at risk of replicating the isolation and shame that happens in families where things are unspeakable um, and letting that kind of mandate to silence or to alienation become the cultural fabric. Um, and that's what we see in many, many organizations. People are scared to ask for help. They're worried and anxious when they make mistakes. They don't really support each other in developmental um, frameworks. They might give feedback, but they don't have the compassionate eyes to understand when somebody's acting in ways that are less constructive, that they're really basically importing a childhood survival strategy that was brilliant once, um, but now it's a bit antiquated and doesn't serve them. And instead of looking with the eyes of a sensitive healer, they look with the eyes of a critical uh, sort of accountability boss or a coach. Um, and I think that relation, as you're saying, is 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 the medicine. But what do we mean by relation? We mean, I'm deeply invested in knowing the life you've walked. I really want to listen and hear the pain you carry. I really want to understand in an attuned, empathic, receptive way, what your gifts are, what your dreams are, what matters to you. I'm willing to hear when you see the world very differently than I, and how the lens of your life experience, your cultural experience, your own family experience shapes your perceptions meaningfully divergent from my perceptions. All of those skills create the possibility of real synergy, of real collective intelligence, of real inclusion. Uh, and I think as Bob would suggest, those are the most essential emotional intelligence tools that we need in order to operate as effective high-performing teams. Um, I, I think another part of your question is what enables us at Mobius and, and you know some of our peer companies to go in and do this kind of deeper healing work. I think it's two things. I think it's an absolute conviction that this is what's needed and a certainty that people yearn to be freer with each other. And having seen thousands of executives go through this journey of dropping their guard, dropping their shield, meeting each other in a meaningful, beautiful, loving way, um, I know for sure when we start a program that people will be grateful for that unlock, even if at first it seems unusual for a professional context or a little bit awkward. Um, within 72 hours, people melt that sort of social pretext um, and are very, very thankful for the chance to speak their truths, to hear each other in a touching way and to offer themselves to one another. We have a natural impulse to love. Um, and all you need to do is really create a context in which that natural kindness has a blessing um, in order to watch people transform how they operate with each other. Mm -hmm. And I find it enormously touching over and over to see the, to encounter that melting. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I, I also have learned a tremendous amount from your uh, vast ability to receive and presence people's life stories about what it means to hold someone in their real truth. Yeah, that's beautiful. And and that that uh, just what you said now, uh, and also the vastness of the impact that uh, you and Mobius have had uh, on on organizations. So, because it. I think it also requires a tremendous amount of inner work that you have done 
to be able to walk into an organization and and be already the transformation as you bring your work into organizations because many people might say no that I can't I can't even sell these programs to any organization because they don't want that but obviously you go in and the door is open and you are very successful in in bringing your programs into different organizations so maybe let's talk a little bit about the inner availability, the inner integration, the inner looking at one's own trauma history, that that's an, an, a key element in being successful in doing transformational work. Because sometimes transformational work is kind of all kinds of good sets of ideas and concepts and flowcharts and I don't know, all kinds of uh, you know structures and uh, diagrams. But actually, that's not how your work works. I mean, you also have some, you know, decks and, and slides, but that's not what does your work. So maybe you can speak a little bit what's actually needed on this on the side of the facilitator, the practitioner, the coach, to be able to be a transformational agent. That's not just intellectual understanding of transformation. No, that's of course right. I mean, I'd love to, you know, answer that question and then turn it back to you because I love to hear you on this topic and it's a mutual passion of ours. Mm -hmm. um, you're, uh, of course, that's right. A transformation of this kind where you're inviting somebody to um, stop everyday social norms and trying to create a space, you know, Amy Edmondson would call it a psychologically safe space. We might say a container of, of restoration. Um the ability or the art, the craft of creating that kind of a space lives largely in the field you walk in with as a faculty. Mm -hmm. And that field is created, of course, from your expertise and knowledge, and you have to have studied trauma, and you have to understand adult development, and ideally you all also understand team dynamics and something about organizational development. It's not that there isn't intellectual rigor behind what we do, but the true um, agent of change is the quality of transmission that you bring um, so that you are a field of deep listening, uh, that you suspend a quality of judgment or reactivity, that you pay attention to the signals that are happening live in the room, because every micro, micro interaction that you see in an executive is the signal. It's a parallel process the same way it would be between a therapist and a client. It's a signal to how they operate in their daily life. And if you can induct a field of grace, which is really the, the highest part of this art, um, which you've profoundly helped me to do and helped Mobius to learn to do, in that field of grace, the intelligence that shows up, the, the particular behavioral signposts that show up are the ones that matter um, because there's a kind of pressing in of higher intelligence that's, that in, is an invitation to revelation. That might be the way I would say it. And what gets revealed, if you pay attention, then gets amplified. So the quality of presence and the quality of uh, looking that the practitioner brings is itself an invocation to significant data. And the harvesting of that data when it shows up creates a kind of electricity in the room where people realize that, that 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 what is being brought forth will be attended to and will be met. And sometimes it's met with an act of, of great listening. Sometimes it's met with a very clear confrontation um, and, and one that isn't laced with judgment. And that's, a, that's also to intervene with precision and a generosity of spirit is part of the craft um, so that you can know that I won't let you Act in a way that doesn't serve your highest values, your highest intentions, and your real beauty in my presence. If you do something that is outside of the meridian, we will name that and look why that's happening in a really curious, really engaged way. So then in that looking, you have the possibility of freedom. In that looking, you have a possibility of insight. But all of that requires a facilitator that has done enough of their own inner work to bring that quality of presence, that fearless willingness to name things in the moment, the ability to work emergently, not dependent on the curriculum, but that sees the people in the room and the live process as the curriculum. Um, and I'm, I'm, as we're speaking, I'm reminded of something very beautiful I learned from you very early on in our collaboration that in a way your conversation is not with their conscious mind. Your conversation is with their highest possibility. And when that's what you're a stand for in the room, it really does catalyze a, an expedited process of people moving from their contracted way of being into a much more 
mature way of being and of of, of interacting. Uh, so that's at least the first part of an answer. Um, you and I have for many years sponsored supervision groups uh, among Mobius practitioners. And that is a, a, an activity that we do out of the conviction that the person is the instrument of the repair and the seriousness of constantly refining and looking at your own trauma, at your own places of contraction, at your own fears, um, which all of us have and all of us walk with. Certainly I have done years and years of inner um, therapeutic work. And, you know, I still feel very much at the beginning of that journey in many ways. It's a constant recommitment, rededication that polishing your instrument is the walk of a practitioner and is a requirement of this kind of work. I think those supervision groups do a second thing that are worth naming. Because Mobius practitioners and community and, and, and many of our peer companies do this as well, are willing to go to the darkest and most vulnerable, most fractured, most you know um, archaic parts of our psyche in each other's presence and take that as a natural obligation of journeying and working together. We are then, I think, a source of inspiration and intimacy when we go into a client company because they can feel the deep trust that we have for one another and the kind of nakedness we show to one another um, as an invitation to change the way workplaces interact um, and the quality of relationship in the workplace. And I think if we didn't do that ourselves, it wouldn't be an honest invitation to others. I think that that congruence of we walk our talk in that way as a collective is very important principle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you, you're framing this beautifully and so eloquently that that the the inner work that we do as facilitators, coaches, therapists, whatever, however we work, is that's that's the gold and that's the commitment to walk our talk too. We cannot talk about transformation and not doing our own transformation. So only by being transformation and being emergent. Uh, I think we we can do this kind of work, and that opens the doors. That that kind of inner space. Another mutual friend of ours, William Urey, like a very very world famous mediator, um, is speaks about that like that the mediator is 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 a consciousness in the room, and I think the facilitator or coach is an awareness, a consciousness in the room, and only what we can host in ourselves. Is that is what we hold non-judgmentally? That's what we hold with compassion, but also with clarity and presence, as you said. And and so I think also what I have seen in Mobius since I'm, we are we are collaborating already for a long time. I think that commitment of many people that are uh, teams that work uh, in this do this transformational work. I think that's really amazing that that there is a very deep commitment to one's own transformation. And, and as we have seen in the supervision groups, that every time we bring something that looks like a difficulty, it's actually the fuel for our own growth. So even the difficulties with clients are actually welcome because that's what that's what induces our own growth. That's the engine of our own evolution. And so I, I feel that uh, Mobius really... Uh, walks its talk uh, on, on that level. And so that's really beautiful. I'm very and proud of that. And I just want to say one more thing about what you just said, Thomas, that ability to use the breakdowns in everyday work as an, as a guidepost to what to look at in your, in yourself and the stuck places that you are in your own psyche is also part of what we're teaching leaders. So then everyday work becomes a chance to heal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a very different way of orienting yourself as a leader. How can I, in managing other people, look for where they're getting stuck as a gateway to where I can help them to evolve rather than a problem I need to give them, you know, feedback about? And so, um, you know, this notion that in the workplace, you have an enormously unique opportunity to be a context for people's continued growth. And development, um, I think that's a very important tenet, not just for practitioners, but for leaders in any context. That's very true. And you described something else that I, I want to highlight for everybody who's listening, is you're saying if we use the kind of appearance of our own stagnation, which usually shows up as difficulties, frictions, conflicts, miscommunication, many ways. So when, when we don't see that as a problem, but we see that as a chance for transformation and growth, then we actually contribute to what so many organizations really want, which is progress. We want to move, but we want to be more successful. We want to expand. We want to do what we do even better. So how do we do that? Through progress. And 
taking care of, of our inner individual, relational, team, organizational stagnations and difficulties is actually what makes an organization, I believe, successful besides the skills that we need to have. But many organizations do have the skills to do what they do. But the interpersonal frictions, the intrapersonal difficulties, uh, and the organizational dynamics are often the sand in the engine. And please feel free to comment on that. Yeah, I agree with that completely. And I think there are also very subtle ways that untreated fear and unaddressed trauma live in relation in organizations. So just to pick another example, if I feel like I have to defend my value all of the time because I haven't yet wired basic self-esteem and I don't rest in the sufficiency and goodness of my gifts, then I get very rigid in defending my perspective or my point of view. And I'm unlikely to be constantly sort of cognitively agile and learning and looking for what I might be missing and why somebody might see it differently which means the innovation capacity of that organization has a ceiling. Mm -hmm. Literally, it has a ceiling because the leaders don't feel safe inside themselves to be in a learning mode, to be in the, in the humility of fresh thinking. Um, and you mentioned spaciousness as, an, as a dimension of, of relation. It also means I'm less available for fresh intelligence downloading into my system. So I'm not likely to get the disruptive breakthrough idea as much as somebody who's cultivated a kind of inner mindfulness, equanimity, spaciousness, and isn't caught in their expertise and knowledge base, but is actually open to life teaching them wherever that knowledge comes from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. And that actually also matches again uh, my conversation with, with Bob the other day. Um, because he said, you know, like he works a lot on the transformation of the reactive leader into a self-authored leader. And but then we talked yesterday or the other day, we talked about what's what's actually the quality of being authored. So there's something beyond self-authorship is being authored, like bowing to some higher dimension of, of potentiality or inspiration or insight that actually becomes the driving engine. And that's also a bit what you said. And, and also Bob refers to, if we don't do our inner work, then we are less available to that future. And, and I had another conversation with, with Otto Schammer um, and and he said it beautifully. It's like the future is that which depends on you to be manifested. Mm -hmm. And that's beautiful. And 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 I think what you said right now, if we don't do that that inner work, we are less avail available to innovation. And actually, that's also why innovation often doesn't really manifest itself, even if we have great ideas, because we're actually afraid to make the steps that are uh, needed to do. And maybe you can say a little bit to that, and then uh, maybe we can talk about being authored in our next conversation and uh, let this uh, be our cliffhanger for next time. Yeah, I love that. Um, so just for context for those listening, um, when Bob talks about self-authorship, he's referencing the work of Bob Keegan and Lisa Leahy, two colleagues that I have the privilege of having as Mobius senior experts, who define three stages of adult development. Uh, and Thomas, you're pointing at sort of the transformational end of that continuum. At the beginning of that continuum, they call socialized mind, where someone is really very externally referencing and making their meaning of their lives out of the things the society values, prestige, money, success, um, sort of external benchmarks um, of meaning. And at some point in the journey of a leader that they accomplish all those things and they suddenly look around and realize the hollowness and emptiness of that. And often when leaders come into our programs or come to us for coaching, it's right at that juncture um, where they have come up against uh, all of the st uh, stages of success they had thought would matter to them. They've pursued them all, they've accomplished them all, and they look around and realize they're quite disconnected. There's not a lot of uh, closeness to their heart or to their soul. Uh, and that begins what uh, Bob and Lisa call the self-authorship journey, where you really start to really articulate what your own values are, what your own sense of purpose is, what your unique gifts are, what in life calls you to contribute. Um, and that's a very important threshold and a very important journey. But of course, what you said is really quite, um, I think, expansive in the sense that even after all of that self-development and self-expression, there comes a moment where it's not about you anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another threshold of maturity. Um, in Kabbalah, they talk about that as the moment when you move from the will to receive to the will to bestow, which I love. 
Um, and that really is the moment where you start to see your own life as in the service of life. And when you make that bowing down to be available to uh, offer your gifts, in, in not in the service of your self-gratification, but just in the service of blessing life, then that is the, in a way, that's the first day in which you can really be used by life for the fullest possibility of what you came into life to give. Um, I'm, I have to say, I'm reminded of one of the things you said the very first evening we met that has stayed with me as a, both a koan and a mantra. You said, um, not until you're at perfect peace with your past, can you virgin birth the part of the future you came into life to give. And it went through me like a lightning bolt, Thomas, because so many of those uh, parts of that sentence point to the work at hand. One is to devote yourself over and over to making peace with your past. And I now understand we mean by that my personal past, my collective past, both the ways in which my ancestors participated in oppression, racism, colonialism, economic inequities, and also the traumas of my past, personal, family, and collective. So the walk or the journey, the lifetime journey, lifetime's journey of coming to perfect peace is the first half of that sentence. But the second half is where we're, you know, are oriented in this conversation. What does it mean to bring the gifts to be at so much completion with my inner yearnings and my inner hurts that I can really start to be a channel for life? Um, and in many ways, that is the journey of what it means to be a practitioner of transformation. Mm -hmm. Right, beautiful. And what it means to be a leader. Imagine our world being led by leaders that uh, are being led by something higher than themselves. So that's uh, a beautiful, maybe a beautiful ending for today. Amy, this is lovely. And since we're going to have a series of these conversations, maybe next time we talk a little bit more about this being authored or being in that stream of inspiration, innovation capacity, and how we bring that also into the difficult areas of our world and our life and our organization. So thank you very much for joining me here. I'm, I'm looking forward to this series with you. And uh, I'm sure many people can take a lot out of what you contributed today. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me, Thomas. Thanks for listening to Point of Relation with Thomas Hubel. Stay connected and get updates about new episodes by visiting our website, pointofrelationpodcast.com, and by subscribing to the Thomas Hubel YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share about us with your community on social media. Thank you. We appreciate your support. Hi everyone, Thomas and I will be holding a free live online event on June 13th, 2023 on the really important topic of becoming a trauma-informed consultant or executive coach. For those of you who are leadership consultants, leadership advisory practitioners, coaches, facilitators, and trainers, we'll be discussing on how to integrate trauma-informed approaches into your practice. We invite you to join us live on June 13th if you can, or to watch the recording afterwards. It's entirely free and you can find out more uh, information about the session and a link to sign up by visiting thomashubel.com. See you soon.